you probably all know uh, uh, very well that in the last few years there has been a, a big expansion, a big growth of interest in thinking about welfare regimes in the global south, uh, and including attempts to construct uh, typologies of welfare regimes across the global south. Uh, and uh, uh, I want to today to, to think uh, uh, about how uh, Africa fits into these kind of global typologies of welfare regimes, how African welfare regimes are similar and how they're different to welfare regimes in other parts of the world. Uh, and then to think, secondly, uh, about why uh, some of these differences arose and, and, and why they continue to persist. So the first part of my talk is about patterns, and the second part is about explanations. And this draws on uh, uh, bits of research that I've done uh, really over the last uh, uh, five or, or more years, uh, both thinking about historical case studies and thinking about the bigger comparative picture. So firstly, some patterns. I, I think it's fair to say that the, the predominant view in most of the literatures that are uh, uh, concern welfare regimes and welfare state building is that welfare states in Africa are laggards, that they are behind whatever trends there are in other parts of the world. And it's, it's very easy to, to find data uh, 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 that seems to confirm this, especially expenditure data. Uh, the first two uh, 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 facts here are from the uh, ILO's uh, World Social Protection Report. Is that the right title? The World... Socialist, yeah. The World, or so, whatever it's called, the ILO, the new 2014-2015 ILO report on global social protection. Uh, and the third is from uh, the World Bank. And uh, they're all really uh, they're pointing to the fact that if you compare different regions of the world using some fairly obvious or standard measures, what, what distinguishes Africa is low expenditures and low coverage. Uh, in other words, very limited uh, decommodification, to use a sort of Esping Anderson, Polanyian term, very limited decommodification of very few people in Africa. That's the impression you get. It's an impression which is also formed, I think, from most of the historical work, I think, of, of classic studies such as John Eilef's uh, book on the African poor, uh, written in, published in, in, in the late 1980s, the, 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 the thesis of which really is that states in Africa have done nothing for the poor. Uh, you may be aware of the volume by uh, Ian Goff and co-authors published in 2004 on welfare regimes across the South, one of the first, probably the first attempt really to think about uh, variety across the global South. And in, in, in that book, uh, The Case Study of Africa by uh, uh, Philippa Bevan, uh, uh, describes African welfare regimes as being either insecurity reg uh, regimes, where the state actually undermines security, or the most informal security regimes, where the poor rely upon kin or, or foreign kin uh, through remittances uh, rather than the state. So the general view is of, of, of a, 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 a continent where... Uh, welfare states are, are laggards. Uh, to, there is, uh, to say that this is untrue would be a, a hard case to argue, but it's a half-truth. Uh, and I want to explain uh, why it's a half-truth and why I think it really misses uh, thinking about uh, what African <laughs> welfare states actually do do. So, but firstly, the concept of a welfare state is probably rather less uh, uh, straightforward than we often think. Right, and I'm, I'm going to be focusing really on here what a state does, so I'm going to talk about welfare regimes, but I'm really focusing on what the state does within a welfare regime. And classically, uh, the literature on welfare states uh, in the global north, in Europe, would focus on these three dimensions of what welfare states do. Uh, public education, public health care, and income maintenance. Right, and there would be some kind of synergies between social policies and perhaps housing policies, labour market policies, and so on. Uh, so these are the kinds of, of core pillars of the classic uh, uh, 20th century welfare state. 
But, uh, uh, of course, income maintenance can take two forms, and I'm going to say a lot more about this today. Uh, the, the standard difference that we might focus on is the difference between social, social insurance, contributory programs, uh, 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 and social assistance, suppose so-called non-contributory programs, uh, social pensions for the elderly, uh, conditional cash transfers, uh, and, and so on. Now, even when we think about contributory and non-contributory programs, we already begin to have a, 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 li a little bit of a, a, a difficult border area. I was talking to Katia the other day about Argentina. In Argentina, uh, you know, there, is, there are a lot of supposedly contributory programs which are run in the manner of social insurance, but where the state pays the contributions essentially for poor people. So you get unemployment benefits uh, through the social assurance machinery, even if you yourself haven't in fact contributed uh, in the past. And this is exactly what uh, much of Europe, including most famously Britain, did between in the 1920s and the 1930s, uh, uh, where there was notionally unemployment insurance for contributors, but most unemployed were not former contributors, or they were unemployed for much longer than the, the, the period that they could receive benefits. And so in the Great Depression in Europe, in Britain and elsewhere, the state, in fact, provided massive subsidies to unemployment insurance, uh, hence the, in, in English the term the dole, which is essentially the non-contributory benefit for the unemployed. Uh, uh, they provided massive subsidies to social insurance so that, in fact, it was a muddle of social insurance and social assistance. So the boundaries between social insurance and social assistance are often much less clear than we like to think with these neat conceptual terms. Uh, uh, in fact, there's a whole lot of other uh, uh, areas of income maintenance and, uh, and, and welfare support which are difficult to think about. Uh, and in fact, it's these which are, are, are particularly widespread in Africa, historically and in the present, um, and if we start thinking about these, and African welfare states look less like laggards and more like uh, a rather distinctive uh, species or, or, or kind of welfare state. So, for example, public employment programs. Now, now uh, often public employment programs are included under social assistance as cash-for-work programs. Uh, uh, that's fairly recent. Uh, uh, public employment programs have quite a long history in some parts of Africa. Um, of course, uh, cash for work might be social assistance, but what about food for work programs? Right? As soon as you start thinking about benefits in kind through food uh, distribution, this falls outside of most conventional understandings or most traditional understandings of social assistance. Uh, and yet these are particularly important in Africa. Food aid, emergency food aid, and I should say here also non-emergency food aid, uh, 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 very important in urban areas. Um, sorry, this at the bottom right should say subsidised benefits in kind, not in kin, in kind. That's a bit of a mistake. Um, uh, these are all areas in which, in which, in practice, poor people are decommodified. They're decommodified in that their, their, their well-being does not depend... Uh, upon market forces. The state is decommodifying them, but decommodifying them not through cash transfers only, but also through in-kind transfers. Uh, uh, in the late 2000s, probably the biggest welfare state in, term, in the world in terms of coverage was Zimbabwe. Uh, in 2008, 2009, 50% of the Zimbabwean population lived on food aid provided by the World Food Programme. Now, do we consider that to be a form of quasi-welfare state? Right? In the Zimbabwean case, it was channeled through NGOs, not through the state, uh, for uh, obvious diplomatic reasons. Uh, but half the population was decommodified. I mean, this is massive, a massive exercise in decommodification. Um, and then finally, at the bottom left... Uh, I'll say a bit more about this in a moment. We have the problem of provident funds. Uh, provident funds, which are historically quite important in some parts of Africa, provident funds are contributory. Uh, do they count as social insurance? Well, a provident fund is much more like an individual uh, 
uh, Chilean style savings account than it is like social insurance with risk pooling, uh, but historically has served some of the same purposes. So it becomes very difficult to decide in the African context what is a wealth, what, what falls under the welfare state and what doesn't. Now, when the ILO and the World Bank give us figures on spending, they're excluding a lot of this. All right. Uh, and it's very hard to actually get good data on, on, on pricing this. Uh, if, we were to, if we had good data on pricing this, it would make quite a big difference to, uh, uh, to the, the kind of statistics paraded by the ILO, the World Bank, and so on. So uh, uh, I'm going to suggest that, that I'm going to argue, and I'm going to show you some more evidence in a moment, that, that African welfare regimes are, are, are distinctive but because they, they tend to do things uh, which don't get easily measured and don't get measured using conventional uh, measures. Some of the things they do, do get measured, and I'm going to uh, 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 show you that in a moment. So, uh, if we go back to, to the work of, of Ian Goff and, uh, and various co-authors, including uh, uh, when she was here at the ILO, Miriam Abu Shark, uh, that looking at, at welfare regimes, they, te- they, they presented what was in effect a, uh, a typology of regimes which, which varied across uh, 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 essentially how much the state did. Uh, in, this isn't exactly how they presented it, but the, the gist of it is, is was the state uh, doing bad things on the left, was it doing very little in the middle, or was it doing uh, quite a lot on the right? And uh, uh, the, some of their examples, with hindsight, are quite counterintuitive. So, for example, amongst their insecurity regimes, they included cases like uh, uh, Ghana and Ethiopia, right, which, if we look at Africa today, would probably, we could make a strong case that, to, that 10 years later, actually, these would be quite far to the right of this picture for reasons that I'll say in a moment. Um, Cases in the middle included also some, some curious cases. So, for example, South Africa, uh, which, which, as I'll say in a moment, is very distinctive in terms of its very, very generous uh, or exceptional spending on social assistance programs. They counted as a, a failing informal security regime. The only cases they had of nascent welfare states in Africa were either in North Africa and, or Kenya. Anyone who knows about Kenya will find this, this quite intuitive, that Kenya is somehow more of a nascent welfare state than South Africa or Botswana uh, 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 or even, for that matter, Ghana or Ethiopia. Uh, why? Well, really because the, the, of the data they used in their, in their measurement. They tended to use expenditure data with, a, as I said, a, a quite a narrow definition of what kinds of expenditures counted. Uh, they, were, they were including education and health care as well as cash transfers, but they, may, they didn't include non-cash uh, transfers at all. Um, and they also looked at remittance flows. So if you were a country which received substantial remittances from abroad, you were immediately kind of pushed to the left because the, the, the relative to what kin were doing, the state was not doing so much. And then most problematically, they looked at outcomes. They looked at uh, measures of, of, of health and literacy. Their motivation for this was that this was a reflection of what the state had done before, which is a, which is a reasonable logic, uh, but it, it creates some very strange results. The strangest being, of course, in South Africa and Botswana, which, which, which whilst they are building their welfare states by most measures that I would think are, are meaningful, was becoming a... A, a, a more and more informal state because health outcomes were declining. Health outcomes were declining because of AIDS. Right? So an exogenous shock. You can't blame the fact that AIDS hits Africa on the, on, on the state. You can blame the South African state for not having a better reaction to AIDS in the early 2000s. But AIDS itself was exogenous. Right? Uh, 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 mortality were inevitably went up. Uh, and, and you have an exogenous shock, which means that some of the biggest welfare states in Africa cease to appear to be welfare states in this, in this measure. So uh, I think that this obscures much more than it, it reveals. Uh, one of the other 
uh, let me just skip this, actually. If anybody is interested, one of the other major comparative studies of welfare regimes by Nita Rudra, uh, a book and a journal article, uh, is, uh, I think also uh, we can come back to that in questions if we need to. So um, I want to suggest an alternative typology which focuses not so much on 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 uh, on on uh, uh, on sort of these aggregate expenditure data and outcomes, but rather thinking much more closely on on who are the who are the target beneficiaries. What is the what is the let's call it the welfare state distribution regime? What is it trying to do? Well, it strikes it seems to me, and I, and I, I, my argument is that we can identify in most of the 20th century three major emphases in welfare regimes across the global south, depending on on the target the target audience, if you like. Uh, the one the one uh, family of regimes is is our workerist regimes, where the focus is very much on workers. And here I have in mind the, the kind of the major countries in Latin America, uh, especially in the southern cone, but also uh, well, Brazil, Mexico, uh, the more industrialised cases uh, of really where where uh, welfare states are built up around uh, a fairly corporatist arrangements for for urban and industrial and public sector workers in the middle and second half of the 20th century. Uh, a second approach, which is much, which predominated in British colonies, especially in Africa, but also South Asia, uh, uh, focused much more on peasants. Right? Uh, and this is, involves a very different set of public policies, but po- policies which were welfareist in their ambition in important respects. Uh, a third case... Uh, a, third, a third form of regimes which in the 20th century, I, in the mid-20th century, I would refer to as pauperist regimes, which were regimes focused on the urban and the rural poor. And, now, these were exceptions in the, in, the, in, the mid, in the mid-20th century. They've become much more common in, in the last 20 years with the expansion of social assistance programs across the global south. Uh, and uh, in, in, in an era of democracy, and so rather than calling them pauperist regimes, which is appropriate in a pre-democratic context, it's better to think of them as citizenship regimes. So they become much more common. Now, uh, unfortunately, uh, it's it's almost impossible to 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 find good historical data that we can use to measure agrarian agrarian regimes in the mid 20th century. Right. What we can do is measure much better the choices and the balance between workerist regimes and pauperist regimes, because we actually have quite a good measure of this. And the measure is how much does a state spend on social insurance and how much does it spend on social assistance. Social insurance, almost all of which is tied to formal employment, is to, is to workers. Right. Social assistance... Uh, which is generally targeted, not always, but generally targeted on the poor, uh, uh, is, is a good measure of, of, of a kind of the pauperist, if you like, or citizenship elements in a welfare regime. Right. Now, I'm going to use data which, uh, n- which uh, from uh, Wegan and Grosch's uh, first attempt to compile data from the World Bank in 2008, where they allocate programs between social assistance and social insurance, Right. They, include, uh, uh, they include a number of in-kind benefits here. Right. Uh, so it, from my point of view, this is the first attempt really to get good data that includes the value of in-kind benefits. And if you incli- include the value of in-kind benefits, right, uh, one problem you have is you have a very small N of countries with data at all. So you'll see here, sub-Saharan Africa, N equals 9, uh, but there's also 5 or 6 in North Africa, uh, which are very similar in fact. Uh, and uh, we can immediately see a quite distinctive pattern here. Right? That, yes, by these measures, expenditure in Africa is less, certainly, than it is in Eastern Europe and Central Asia, right? but by their measures, it's not much less than it is in, uh, in, in, uh, in any other region across the global south. Most importantly, it's the only region in which more is spent on social assistance than on social insurance. North Africa in fact, is like sub-Saharan Africa in this respect. If we redid this, I should redo, their, redo this graph of theirs and show the whole of Africa. The whole of Africa looks pretty much like their sub-Saharan column here. Middle, the Middle East is a little bit different. North Africa is more like the rest of Africa. So, 
Using their data, we can perform. We can do. We can uh, you know use cluster analysis uh, to see well you know what kinds of cases cluster where. So here I've 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 just graphed social insurance expenditure and social assistance expenditure on the uh, horizontal and the vertical axis. Uh, and I've, I've calibrated both in terms of, social, of standard deviations from the mean so that we have the same distribution on, 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 on each, uh, each characteristic. And, uh, and the different shapes and colours here show the different clusters. So what are these clusters? Well, I, I label them like this, that we have uh, workerist regimes which are going across uh, uh, from essentially the bottom, from the bottom left across to the right, Right, so as they spend essentially more on workers, they move in that direction. Uh, and we have pauperous regimes which are moving up, They're spending more on social assistance and generally not very much, certainly relatively, on, on social insurance. Uh, wh what countries are where in the Weigand and Gosh data set? Well, unsurprisingly, post-communist Central and Eastern Europe is on the bottom right. Uh, uh, the higher spending countries in Latin America, such as Brazil, are, are quite a long way to the right. Uh, uh, the, the most of Latin America uh, is, is in the sort of bottom middle, uh, and Africa and South Asia uh, is, is moving up on the left-hand side. So quite distinctive uh, patterns here. There's a, lot of data, there's a lot of missing data here. For the countries that I've investigated, you know, the missing, when we put in missing cases, uh, it, it, it just confirms this general picture. So um, what's going on here? Well, we, we can run some regressions on, 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 on these uh, 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 measures. The first three models, the first three columns here, are running regressions on social insurance spending, and the, 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 the second set of three columns are models on social assistance spending. Uh, the first model just shows regional dummies. And it, and it says, if you just say, can we predict how much a country spends on social insurance on the basis of region, then region appears to be quite significant. That, uh, that uh, Africa spends less than the average. Uh, um, many regions spend less than the average. Uh, uh, the, the baseline comparison here is Latin America. Uh, Post-communist Central Eastern Europe spends a lot more. Right? But once we be begin to put in controls for uh, development, then the regional effects largely disappear. So you can see in the second column, we've put in controls for industrialization of the labor force and urbanization, and almost all of the regional effects uh, cease to be significant, um, excepting Central and Eastern Europe, uh, and uh, the coefficients for what it's worth are, are much, much closer to zero. And the third column, I put in a whole, th a whole bundle of, of variables, ethno-linguistic fractionalization, measure of democracy, and so on. It doesn't change the picture very much. But essentially, uh, Africa is not distinctive in terms of how much it spends on social assurance once one controls for development and other things. That's the, that's the takeaway from this. Africa is, is, that's not why Africa is, is distinctive. Africa is distinctive because of its spending atypically, unpredictably more, if you like, on, on social assistance, which the second set of columns show us. We can see the second set of columns more or less repeats the exercise, uh, firstly in Model D, just with regional dummies, and then in Models E and F with uh, other controls. And the, 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 the being in Africa... Uh, uh, is, is, correlates with spending more, significantly more, on social assistance, right? even when you control for levels of development, uh, democracy, ethno-linguistic fractionalization, and so on. Right. So put it another way, if we go back to this graph, you know, Africa is in the, African cases tend to be in the top left, not because... That they, not because they are really spending much less than you would expect on social insurance, because that's really because they're not very industrialised, but because they're spending much more than you would expect on social assistance. Why? I, I'm rapidly running out of time. Um, so what's going on here? Well, let's look at this. Just, this, this just shows us the development story. This just plots social insurance expenditure by GDP per capita, and we can see there's a, a, a general, what I've just said. 
development, uh, as, as countries develop, they spend more on social insurance. So uh, there's, we don't have a huge task of explanation on, the, on, the, uh, on explaining social insurance. We, we, we have a small task, and that is why even those countries that you would expect to spend more because they are relatively developed, South Africa, Mauritius, Botswana, etc., why do these countries not spend more? And also we could say for the North African cases, Egypt. Right? That South Africa, uh, Botswana, Mauritius, Egypt spend much less than you would predict from the regression model on social insurance. There's no problem explaining why Kenya doesn't have big social insurance, but there is a problem explaining why South Africa and Mauritius don't have more. So I'm going to say a little bit about that. But this is really what we have to explain. Why, why do some countries spend more on social assistance and development makes, seems to make no difference? Level of development uh, has no uh, observable predictive power with regards to social assistance. So let me very quickly say what my, my research uh, has focused on. Uh, I've done quite a lot of research on the, on the colonial and very early post-colonial period, mainly in the case of these these exceptions, the countries that we would expect to spend more on social insurance, but for some reason never developed large social, uh, social insurance systems, South Africa and Mauritius especially. Right. Uh, uh, this bit in the middle is a bit of a black hole to me still. Um, I can say a bit about it if anyone wants to know. And I've now got a big project looking at the contemporary period uh, on, uh, on, on policy reform in, uh, in really the last uh, 15 to 20 years. So, firstly, how do we, how do we, the question, if you, if you remember, the question about social insurance really is not why, is there no, why are there no workers' regimes in, in Kenya or, or Ghana, because we wouldn't expect that, but why, why are there no workers' regimes uh, in other words, social insurance-based systems in countries like South Africa and Mauritius. So, what's the story? Um, well, as I said, it, the general picture is it, it's largely, but not entirely, because of the small size of the urban, industrial, working and middle classes. This isn't a sufficient explanation, because Mauritius, South Africa, uh, had large uh, um, urban and industrial uh, classes. Uh, so... Um, What's the story? Is it because policymakers were ignorant of the possibility? No, we can discard that. Uh, in the cases that are, are, are curious, like South Africa and Mauritius, there, there was an endless series of government commissions, political parties, uh, civil society organisations, actively interested in advocating social insurance reforms from uh, the 1920s uh, through to uh, uh, the present. Uh, so it wasn't a, a lack, it wasn't ignorance, which explains why uh, these African cases did not go down the workerist route. Right. Um, in the rest of Africa, uh, we can uh, very quickly, I, sorry, the third factor here, critical conjunctures. Right. Uh, if we look at the, the history of welfare state building in Europe uh, or in North America, uh, war plays a, 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 an absolutely important part. Um, and... Uh, by and large, a uh, uh, few parts of Africa had quite the uh, ex experiences in the course of the mid-20th century, uh, which was very important in welfare state building in Europe, um, or perhaps even in East Asia, uh, uh, or uh, especially. Uh, nor were there uh, uh, revolutionary movements on the sort of scale that uh, uh, characterised some Latin American cities in, uh, in the 1920s especially. Uh, that, that's a minor factor. Across the whole of Africa, the absolutely crucial factor was that the colonial state uh, essentially uh, sent out instructions in the 1940s that welfare was not something which was appropriate in colonies uh, or agrarian economies uh, and that uh, nationalist elites who thought it was needed to be uh, uh, disabused of this notion uh, that actually what uh, colonies needed was was uh, healthy, uh, productive peasants, and that colonial officials should be investing their efforts into building a peasantry, essentially into building what I'm calling agrarian regimes at that time, which were uh, focused on making sure that you invest in peasants uh, through uh, uh, peasant-oriented agricultural development policies and, in times of need, uh, food aid and employment, emergency employment programmes. 
the, that was true in the agrarian societies. It doesn't explain South Africa and, and Mauritius quite so well. So what were the constraints? Uh, the constraints on, on reforms in the 1940s, 1950s, 1960s, where we might have expected more workerist reform. Well, the first was that, uh, uh, unlike Latin America... Uh, at this time, most of the African economies were uh, open economies, uh, very focused on, uh, on exports. Uh, and the classic case is Mauritius. Mauritius is a country you would have expected, in many respects, to have a workerist, very workerist welfare state. Um, but Mauritius did not. Mauritius did not for the very simple reason that the Mauritius economy was totally dependent upon the sugar industry and the assessment of the colonial state was that the, sugar, the Mauritian sugar industry could not bear the cost of contributory programs right? because it would make Mauritian sugar uncompetitive on global markets. So a straight open economy constraint on, on, uh, on, uh, on, 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 workerist, on a workerist kind of program. So in Mauritius, Mauritius followed the kind of advice which the colonial office in Britain was telling all of its colonial governments if you, the best thing to do is to support peasants. If you can't support peasants, the second best thing to do is to introduce the kind of pauperist programs associated with uh, some sort of 19th century, early 20th century British reforms, essentially kind of poor law based programs. So Mauritius, in 1950, after long delays, introduced non contributory old age pensions. So introduced non contributory old age pensions for mostly for. Uh, a proletarianised workforce, agricultural workforce, uh, because it couldn't go the contributory route because contributions would push up production costs, squeeze uh, competitiveness, right? uh, and also because it couldn't go an agrarian route because there was no land to give to peasants uh, because everything was just a good plantation. There, was no, there were very few peasants. So that, that, the const- that, that's the first constraint. Second constraint in fact, is that democratization initially had a counterintuitive effect. When we think of democratization now, we think of the effects on popular demands. Democratization fuels popular demands for spending programs. Uh, in the 19, 1960s, across most of Africa, what democratization generally did, uh, and Mauritius again is the, is the extreme case, was to induce caution. So parties which had demanded reforms prior to achieving power, as soon as they were given power in executive power in Mauritius, they said, whoa, actually, maybe we should not do what we've been thinking about in the past. Right? Maybe the colonial state was quite sensible to tell us not to go for uh, social insurance. And so, in fact, the, the Mauritian Labour Party, which effectively achieved power, executive power in the late 1950s, uh, it was another 20 years before it introduced contributory pensions in addition to the non-contributory pensions it inherited. So democratization actually encouraged conservatism rather than more, more uh, uh, um, expenditure uh, uh, in, in many cases. And finally, uh, uh, if we look at both the late colonial and uh, early post-colonial period, um, uh, I think it's fair to say that uh, that the most reformist ideas widely in circulation were generally liberal ones uh, uh, and they were and the, the real struggle of ideas was between essentially liberal, I, liberal ideas of respecting the market and intervening only where absolutely necessary uh, they were fighting it out with much more conservative ideas the state should do nothing uh, and there wasn't really there's no, so, there was no social democracy there was no meaningful social democratic uh, uh, politics. Trade unions are weak uh, as well. So my the broad explanation of, of why in cases like Mauritius, where we would have expected to find exceptional workerism in Africa, not even in these cases was there uh, a, a big shift towards social insurance of the kind that we associate with uh, most obviously Latin America at the same era. Right. So this summarizes, you know, in a sense, the, the conditions that I think uh, characterize the three types of regime where uh, a workerist would be classically like Brazil, agrarian would be uh, much of Africa, and pauperist would be those parts of Africa where the state was under some pressure to do something 
e.g. Mauritius, e.g. South Africa, right? uh, and, uh, 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 but uh, chose really not to go the workerist route. And, and if you really want a, a summary that uh, workerist route required militant workers and, and, and weak peasants, if you like, agrarian route required weak workers and militant peasants, uh, and the pauperist route is what you did when you started off with an agrarian option, you thought, and, but the peasantry didn't seem to be a sustainable, viable uh, uh, class. And so what did you do in the absence of, of peasants, but where you didn't have, um, uh, uh, where you had economic or political constraints, you would go that route. So very quickly, because I'm running out of time, uh, why, is, why is there some reform in the present? Why is social assistance expanding in contemporary Africa? Uh, and uh, if we were to update the, the, the uh, Vega and Robert Grosch data set, it would show much higher levels of social expenditure in Africa in, in, in social assistance in 2013, 2014 than was the case 10 years ago or 15 years ago with the, the data they had. <clears throat> so why? Well, the, some of the pressures for reform are, are unsurprising. Donors. It, 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 it's, it's fair to say that in, across much of Africa, the, the social assistance uh, uh, reform agenda has been driven heavily by donors. Uh, so donors have been uh, an important factor here. Donors meaning both the bilateral ones, uh, the German uh, GDZ, uh, the differed from Britain, and so on, but also the multilateral agencies, the World Bank, ILO, and so on. Uh, and the uh, the NGOs specialising in, uh, in emergency aid, such as the World Food Programme. Uh, so, is the World Food Programme an NGO? I guess the international NGO. It's a UN agency, is it? I'm not sure how it operates yet. Um, so, donors are a factor for reform. Electoral competition, as we'd expect, a factor for reform. In the most recent elections in Malawi, held earlier this year, uh, uh, the most divisive, uh, discursive issue in the elections... Uh, 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 was uh, the contrast between the incumbent president who said, I am the president of handouts. I give poor people what they deserve. And the opponent, who in fact won, uh, Peter Motika, who won the election, uh, won the president, became president, uh, who said, we are opposed to handouts because handouts uh, are uh, an encouragement to lazy uh, people and we don't need lazy people in Malawi. So the election, the most important discursive issue in the election was, in fact, social assistance programmes. Uh, that's unusual because across much of Africa, if you look at recent elections, everybody says they support the expansion of social assistance programmes. So in Kenya, for example, uh, all of the parties in South Africa, all of the parties say we stand for, uh, for uh, just giving money to the poor through non an expansion of non-contributory social assistance programmes. It's become almost a, you know, a universal element to put into your party manifesto and even to put into speeches. Right. Um, and this is partly encouraged by a very real social change, which is that uh, the kinds of conditions that historically favoured what I'm calling a pauperist regimes, which were uh, urban or rural landlessness, in effect, but without industrialization, they have become much more widespread across Africa. So much of Africa now has both rural landlessness, rural poor and an urban poor, uh, which problems which cannot be solved through workerist employment-linked uh, policies, and ILO now recognises this of course, or uh, and cannot be reached through peasant focused programmes because landlessness, because of landlessness these are people who are not peasants and will never be peasants, so there is a strong pressure for social assistance uh, expansion uh, in a sense of strengthening of what I'm calling what historically were pauperist regimes which would now be more accurately called citizenship regimes providing poor citizens with non-contributory social assistance benefits right? but there are constraints right? uh, and the big constraint really is that amongst African political elites there is still a very strong uh, uh, conservative political culture uh, which thinks that in fact uh, state should not be uh, adopting bolder and bigger programs of this sort. Uh, uh, the emergency food aid, for, uh, supporting kind is one thing, but programs such as old age pensions uh, are, are, are much more uh, uh, questionable. Uh, now, at best, uh, African political elites, for the most part, are liberal, 
the, the liberal African political elites are generally the more reformist ones. Uh, the less reformist ones are, are fairly clearly conservative, and this is a major obstacle. So, for example, in Zambia, which is a country we've looked at in some detail, uh, the donors began supporting pilot social assistance programs in 2003 uh, with the idea that they could demonstrate that pilot programs were poverty-reducing, they didn't have adverse social effects, that they, they only did good things, they did no bad things, and they were affordable. The, the donors, GTZ, differed, piled up the evidence, lots of, of, of evaluations, midterm evaluations, final evaluations, yet more extra evaluations. The ILO showed it was affordable. The whole, the, the whole, the whole, the whole panoply of, of, of donor knowledge was assembled to persuade the Zambian government that, the Zambia, that they should scale up these pilot programs nationally. And the Zambian government said no. This is not what we're interested in, uh, and, uh, uh, and, and resisted it for 10 years. Uh, there was a change of government. The new Zambian government is a little bit more uh, sympathetic. Uh, it is it, ostensibly, it claims to be more social democratic, but still, uh, 40, 11, years, 11 years after, uh, after the first donor-funded pilot programs, actually, we haven't moved beyond pilot programs in Zambia. So there is real resistance to going further uh, in the direction in which uh, many of these countries have in fact moved in the past uh, under and after colonialism. Uh, so this uh, summarises some of the factors which I think uh, uh, are relevant to understanding this, uh, uh, this constrained expansion of social assistance programmes in the present. So to summarise, I've used up my time, uh, African welfare states were different uh, uh, in the 20th century because under colonial rule and after decolonisation uh, they tended to spend on different things than the things that were normally counted by the ILO, etc. and the World Bank. Uh, even if we, count, even if we use, look at the World Bank and uh, expenditure data, we can see they were distinctive uh, by, the, by the 1990s, the Wagon and Grosch data set, showing that they spent much more on social assistance, even if we're not counting everything, than uh, you would predict. Uh, um, uh, not much, they're, not, they're not atypical on the social insurance side. They're much more focused on the poor and much less on workers in other parts of the world. And this continues to be the case, uh, and it's not simply because of the legacy of colonialism, because, in fact, uh, the, kind of the liberal and conservative ideas which shaped that initial trajectory continue to be very powerful in Africa, because I, I would suggest, because in fact, those kind of colonial ideas in fact resonated very closely with the ideas of African political elites uh, after independence. Thank you very much. <laughs>